Greetings all and welcome back to a new lecture. We're going to look at section 1.4 today, separable, separable differential equations. So um, this lecture consists of one technique, four problems, and uh, we should be good to go. So what is separable? Okay, so a first order differential equation is separable if it can be written as y prime equals f of x times g of y. So a product of two functions, one function entire, entirely dependent on x, the other function entirely dependent on y. So just looking at example number one, dy dx is equal to x squared y minus 32 over 6 minus x squared plus 2. We're going to show that separable. Okay. So we need to show it that it's a product of two functions. And right now, we have a sum of two different expressions, okay? We don't have a product of functions. So what, what are we going to do? Well, just following my nose on this, it's probably advisable to get a common denominator. So 16 minus x squared over 16 minus x squared, okay? Because there's nothing else that I can use to factor or anything like that. So let's do the next best thing. Let's get a common denominator. So we have x squared y minus 32 plus 32 minus 2x squared. And that's divided by 16 minus x squared. The 32s cancel, and what am I left with? x squared y minus 2x squared over 16 minus x squared. This is all equal to dy dx. So now what? Well, I want to isolate all the x's and isolate all the y's. Well, there's only one y, okay? Um, to do that, notice that there is an x squared in common in the uh, terms in the numerator. So factor that out. What are you left with? You're left with y in this term and minus 2 there. So this is y minus 2. Okay, and um, there is no y in the denominator. So this is 16 minus x squared. And that is 1. And there's our two functions, x squared over 16 minus x squared times y minus 2. So we were able to write the differential equation uh, as a product of a function that's entirely in terms of x times a function that's entirely in terms of y. Okay, so we're, now that we're able to do stuff like that, why? Well, it's because we want to do the following. Okay, uh, this is a theorem, the differential equation. P of y times dy dx equals q of x has a general solution. Um, and the general solution is the integral of p with respect to y equals the integral of q with respect to x plus c. So here's kind of the process behind it. I don't really want to get too involved in the process, uh, the theoretical part of the process. I just want to solve problems. So let's look at a problem. Number one dy dx equals minus x over y. Now, if you remember back to last lecture, uh, we looked at uh, a slope field for minus x over y. Okay? I'm not going to remind you any more than just that. So look back into your notes and kind of familiarize yourself with it. But what we're going to do is we're going to find a function that solves that differential equation, a general solution to the differential equation. So here's how it works. Um, dy dx equals minus x over y. Okay, so our two functions here are minus x times 1 over y. That was simple. Now, here's how the process works. Once you've separated the right-hand side, what you want to do is you want to take all the terms that involve y and push it to one side of the equation and all the terms involve, that involve x and push it to the other side. So that means you will be splitting up the dy and the dx. Okay. So how do you move the y over to the side where dy is? Well, you multiply both sides by y. Your y dy. And how do you 
get all the x's on the same side of the equation. Well, you multiply it over by dx. So now you have an equation that looks like y dy equals minus x dx. Now, in that process that I kind of skipped over, okay, that is what our goal is. Okay, we want to write it as a function of y times dy equals a function of x times dx. And it's the different, it's different functions than the f and g above. It's p and q, but we don't care about that. All we need to do is write it as a function that's in terms of y times dy equals a function in terms of x times dx. And the next step is to integrate both sides. So when we integrate both sides, we're integrating the right hand side with respect to x and the left hand side with respect to y. Okay, how do I know that? Take a look, dy dx. So integrate this with respect to y. You get one half y squared plus a constant. So I'll call it constant one because I have two integrals, I'll have two constants. On this side, you get minus one half Oops, I've integrated, get rid of that. Minus one half x squared plus constant two. Okay, and at this point, what we want to do is we want to try to solve for y. Okay, um, first off, taking a look at these constants. Okay, these are arbitrary constants, but they are just constants. So that's a number and that's a number. I could subtract c1 to this side of the equation, and I would have a number minus a number. And what would that end up giving me? Well, it would end up giving me a number. Okay, I could call it C3. Okay, so 1 half y squared equals minus 1 half x squared plus C3. And then I could multiply both sides of this equation by 2. And what happens if I do that? I get y squared equals minus x squared plus 2 times c3. Well, what's 2 times c3? Well, that's still a constant. Call it c4. Something like that. And so this is equal to c4. Well, I don't even need to uh, change the order. If I were to add both sides, uh, x squared to both sides, I'd have x squared plus y squared is equal to c4. And c4 is just a constant. Hmm. I should give it a name. Let's call it r squared. Because after all, r is a constant, so r squared is a constant. And we'll just say c4 is r squared. You can see I'm kind of playing f fast and loose with the constants. Okay, When I'm distributed 2 through both these terms, uh, 2 times negative 1 half did give me a negative x squared. 2 times c3, 2 times a constant, just gave me a constant. So we called it just some constant, c, uh, c4. Really, as you see me go through these problems, anytime I'm multiplying a constant by a constant, I won't even give it a new name. I will just call it constant. But what you see at the end of this is that the solutions to the differential equation follow the form x squared plus y squared equals r squared. They're circular. And if you look back into our notes from last time, uh, where we drew a slope field and we kind of plotted two solution curves through two different points, what did they look like? Well, they look like circles. So there you go. They were circles. There's your first problem. Uh, what about problem number two? Or I guess that would be example number three. Find the general solution to y prime equals y squared over x squared plus one. And then we'll do particular solutions after that. But Let's get started there. In this case, I do like Leibniz's notation. Okay, I will call this dy dx for obvious reasons equals y squared over x squared plus one. That way, when I separate the variables, um, you have a dy and a dx and not a y prime. Uh, so what do I need to do to get this? I need a multiply by 1 over y squared. And I need to what? Uh, multiply by dx. 
So what do I end up getting? I end up getting 1 over y squared, dx is canceled, dy, equals y squared is canceled, 1 over x squared plus 1, dx. So there's a function of y times dy and a function of x times dx. This is multiplication. I can put parentheses there if it makes you feel better. And now it's time to integrate. So you integrate both sides on the left. You get minus 1 over y. Okay, now I would say plus a constant. But remember, both sides are going to have a plus a constant. And then I can always add or subtract the constant from one side of the equation to the other side of the equation, and I'd still be left with a constant. So henceforth and forevermore, the side that has the independent variable, that's the x, is just going to be plus c. Okay, instead of saying, call this one c1, call this one c2, and then subtract, subtract c1 from c2, I'm just going to say it's c. How do you integrate 1 over x squared plus 1? That's the arctangent of x. That's one of the integrals that you learned in calculus 2. All right. So here, I can't play fast and loose with this negative. So again, my goal is to solve for y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by a negative. OK, so I get 1 over y on the left equals minus the arctan of x minus c yeah minus c but it's minus a constant and minus a constant is still a constant so let me just call it c i know that's gonna upset some people in the class okay um just know that you know when i distribute this negative this could be minus c but if c was negative then it would be positive blah 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 it's constant okay so last move i uh invert both sides and instead of starting with the negative term, I'll start with the positive c minus the arctan of x. And that's equal to y. And there's my general solution. All right. So what was the next thing that the problem asked? Where am I at? Uh, find the particular solution if y of 0 was 5. So if y of 0 was 5. So part A, look at y of 0 being 5. Find the particular solution. So find the value of c that makes this a true statement. So plug in 5 for y and 0 for x. c minus the arc tan of zero. The arctan of zero is the angle whose tangent is zero. Well, that's zero. So this is one over c minus zero. So that's one over c. So that means 5c is equal to one, so c is equal to one fifth. And my solution is y equals one over one-fifth minus the arctan of x. Part B. Part B says, what if y of zero was zero? On its face, that seems completely harmless. Carry on as you normally would. Okay, go to your general solution. Put 0 in for y. 0 equals 1 over c minus the arc tan of 0. And you get this to be 1 over c. So you say, what value of c makes that true? And the answer is none. That's a contradiction, okay? There's no value of C that makes that true, but that doesn't mean there isn't a particular solution. 
That means what? That means we have to go back and kind of look at the differential equation. Let's look at it with a fresh sheet of paper, one that I haven't written on. This works, it's the old set of notes. What was our differential equation? y prime equals y squared over x squared plus 1. And it had a general solution of y equals 1 over uh, c minus the arctangent of x. So just kind of resetting the stage. And we want to know the particular solution for the initial condition I see y of 0 is 0. And we said we can't use this because we end up with a contradiction. Okay, so what can we use? We go back here. And you said there's something special that when x is 0, y is 0. So if I were to look at this differential equation and I say if x is 0, well, the denominator is 1. That's not really special. But what happens if y is 0? Okay because that's, they're both going through the origin. Well, if y is zero, then y prime is zero. So think back to our slope fields. At the origin, we have zero slope. If we have zero slope, then you stay on the x-axis to the next x pair, x, uh, this next ordered pair. There really isn't a next ordered pair, but let's you know move over a little bit. Well, that x value is non-zero, so the denominator is not 1. It's a little bit larger than 1, but the numerator is still 0. So that means its slope is 0, and this slope is 0, and this slope is 0, this slope is zero. What do you have? You have an equilibrium solution. Okay, so the particular solution to this differential equation with this initial, initial condition is y equals 0. All right, next up. Number four, find the general solution to the differential equation y prime equals 2x divided uh, times y minus one divided by x squared plus three. So we convert to Leibniz's notation, dy dx, is 2x times y minus 1 divided by x squared plus 3. Separate the x's and the y's. That's kind of easy for this one. It's more or less separated for us. Divide over the y minus 1. So we get dy over y minus 1 equals 2x over x squared plus 3 times dx. And if you want, you can just think of this as 1 over y minus 1 times dy. Because now when you integrate, you're going to recognize natural log in this. This is the natural log of the absolute value of y minus 1. And this is the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus 3. How do I know that? Well, the derivative of the denominator is present in the numerator. The derivative of x squared plus 3 is 2x. The derivative of y minus 1, that's 1. Okay, so these are the natural log integrals. And remember, we have our plus c on the independent variable side. Okay, goal here, solve for y whenever possible. Okay, so you're going to see we're going to run into a couple stumbling blocks. And okay, so uh, be ready for that. It's not a big deal, but it may involve some discussion. To solve for y, I need to exponentiate both sides. So e to a power, e to a power. So I get the absolute value of y minus 1 equals the absolute value of x squared plus 3 plus c. This is all raised to the power of e. 
So the E and the natural log cancel each other on this side, but I want to talk about this side right here. Now there's a rule of logarithms, sorry, exponentials, that says um, b to the x plus y equals b to the x, b to the y. And what's the operation between them? It's multiplication. So b to the x plus y is b to the x times b to the y. So that means this, oh, I already goofed up. There's a natural log out here. There we go. So this is equal to e to the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus 3 times e to the c. Okay, using our rules of logs, we can split up the exponent, the sum in the exponent, and write it as a product of exponentials. Now, the e to the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus 3 gives me x squared plus 3. The e and the natural log kill each other off. Here, I have something that's interesting. I have a constant raised to a constant. e is a constant, c is a constant. A constant raised to a constant is constant. Okay, so I can call it c. Again, I know that's going to bug some people. I could have called it k, I could have called it c1, c2, doesn't matter. Constant raised to a constant is still constant. <clears throat> now, I'd like to deal with these absolute value bars. I want to get rid of them, if at all possible. First off, I'll start the product with a constant. The absolute value of x squared plus 3. Well, x squared is plus 3 is positive for any value of x you can think of. So the absolute value bars are kind of meaningless. They're not kind of meaningless. They are meaningless in this example. So it's c times x squared plus 3. And again, we're still equal to y minus 1. Now, what you're about to see is a move that happens quite often. So uh, we're going to do it a couple times, and then we're going to get the gist of what's going on. Okay, so... In other words, we don't want to forget why it's true, okay? but we don't want to do it every time because it slows us down. So, the absolute value of y minus 1 equals c to the times x squared plus 3. Now, the absolute value is an interesting animal. So the absolute value of x is a piecewise function. If x is positive or 0, then the absolute value bars are meaningless. Because if you're taking the absolute value of 7, you get the same thing that's inside the absolute value, it's 7. But if, the absolute, if what's inside the absolute value is negative, then we get the opposite sign of it. So keep that in mind. What I'm telling you, is the absolute value of negative 7 is not 7. It's negative negative 7, which happens to be 7. Okay? So, y is undeclared. So, I can think of certain values of y which makes y minus 1 positive. I can think of other values of y that makes y minus 1 negative. And this has to be true for all y, so how do we approach this? Well, in a piecewise fashion. So you want to, what you want to think is, what happens if y minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0? If y minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, then the absolute value bars in green are meaningless, and we get y minus 1 is equal to c times x squared plus 3. So y equals c times x squared plus 3 plus 1. And you're done. Okay, that's case 1. What happens if y minus 1 is less than 0? If y minus 1 is less than 0, then... Let me get this out of the way, because I think it's... Maybe a little distracting. 
if y minus 1 is less than 0, then the absolute value in bars in green, say, take the negative of what's inside. So that means take y minus 1 and negate it. Okay? And that's equal to c times x squared plus 3. Now, move this negative to the other side. What do we get? We get it there. But that's a negative constant. And a negative constant is yet still a, you got it, constant. So whether it's positive constant, negative constant, it's still constant. So let's call it C. And what do we get? C times x squared plus 3 plus 1. Same thing. That's right there. So, we kind of flushed out this absolute value thing. And what did we find out? Well, the absolute value bars did nothing. And you ended up with C times x squared plus 3 plus 1 as the general solution to the differential equation. Now, I'll do this absolute value bar uh, uh, thing a couple of times, but at some point, we're just going to say it works, and we're not going to keep doing it over and over again, but we are going to understand why it works. I'm firmly committing that to you. Okay, we don't get to use a trick. We don't get to use a shortcut unless we understand why it works. So we'll do it until we understand why it works, and then we'll stop doing it because we want to be uh, uh, save time. Okay. So that was the end of that problem. And we have one more task. Example number five. Solve the initial value problem. Uh, x squared plus 1 times y prime plus y squared equals negative 1 under the condition that y of 0 is equal to 1. All right. First off, let's separate. How are we going to do that? Well, x squared plus 1 times dy dx. I'm going to move the y squared to the other side. Minus 1 minus y squared. Um, that's the same as negative, what, 1 plus y squared? I want to get all the y's on the same side of the equation and all the x's on the other. So let's see. Um, looking at this, x squared plus 1 times dy dx equals negative 1 plus y squared. It didn't do anything in that. But I did see that I can multiply both sides by dx, and I can divide both sides by 1 plus y squared. What does that leave me with? Um, oh, I have an x squared plus 1. I should get rid of that, too. 1 over 1 plus x squared. 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now let's see what it leaves me with. Well, these cancel. The dx's cancel. I'm left with dy times 1 over 1 plus y squared. There's the negative. The 1 over 1 plus y squareds are gone. The dx is there. The 1 over 1 plus x squared is there. There we go. Variables are now separated. So we integrate. And we notice that 1 over 1 plus y squared is a familiar antiderivative. It's the arctangent of y. And this is negative the arctangent of x plus constant. 
There you go. All right. So, let's see here. Next move, we're going to solve for y. So, we'll take the tangent of both sides. The tangent is not a linear operator. We kind of established that in the homework. So, the tangent and the arctangent do kill each other off. But this doesn't. It's not like I can distribute it through both terms. So this is the tangent of c minus the arctan of x. Again, I can't say it's the tangent of c minus the tangent of the arctangent of x and then cancel. Okay, it's got to stay ugly. So there's a general solution for you. We've solved explicitly for y. We'll do so whenever possible. The, home, the problem that uh, I assigned said let y of 0 be 1. Okay, so what happens when y of 0 is 1? So this is the IVP. So the initial condition is that y of 0 is 1. So if y is 1, and x is 0, what do we have here? Well, the arctangent of 0 is 0. So 1 is equal to the tangent of c minus 0. That's the tangent of c. Then I ask myself, um, the tangent of what is 1? Okay, well, Pi over 4. Okay, so c is equal to pi over 4. Therefore, my particular solution, pi over 4 minus the arctan of x. There you go. So, um, I anticipate that some students would have follow-up questions on some of these integrals, okay? Um, beautiful part of uh, the video lecture is you can stop it and take your time to figure out why the integral is what I said it is. If not, uh, then please let me know, and I will do my best to help you walk, uh, walk through that uh, antiderivative for you, okay? Um, I'm assuming that most of the students in the class um, uh, are familiar with this from Calc 2 or Calc 2 uh, via the AB exam or BC exam, something along those lines. Okay, so this, uh, uh, I don't want to call it review, but it's probably something that's uh, um, not new to most everyone. Okay, I uh, hope you're all well, and I will catch you next time.